All right, the title of the sermon this morning is Be a Wise Builder. Be a Wise Builder. And we can see there, as we read in 1 Corinthians 3, that uh, you know, wisdom is not the same in God's eyes as it is in the world's eyes. You've got a wise way to build in the world's eyes, which is about having a comfortable life and having all your bills paid and having everything like that. Whereas being a wise builder is what we're going to talk about in God's eyes this morning as we look to the new year and think about how we're going to spend our time this year and reflect on how we spent our life uh, last year. We want to be a a wise builder in God's eyes, not just a wise builder in the world's eyes, although there is some overlap there. All right, so we'll start here at Ephesians 5. Look at what Ephesians 5 says in verse 15. See then that you you walk circumspectly, not as fools. Right, so circumspectly is like considering all circumstances, right? See that you work, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So like in line with what we talked about last week, like now is the accepted time. Hey, we don't have a lot of time in this world. We want to be living wisely, not living as fools, because we need to redeem the time that we have, the time that is very fleeting and the time we've already lost. You know, and maybe you didn't get saved, you didn't uh, grow up in a Christian home, so you've lost a lot of your life already not living for God. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now, one thing I want to talk about this morning before we get into some of the points about being a wise builder is you know, making sure we have an eternal perspective. Making sure we have an eternal perspective. That, that will make a difference in whether you build wisely or not. Are you building for the temporary Are you building for the eternal? 2 Corinthians 4.16 For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What is that saying? That even though life is hard, you know, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're being encouraged from God's Word, your inward man in the Spirit is, is being encouraged, and that gives you strength in the outward man. For our light affliction, what is he talking about here? Our Our suffering. And you can see here that in light of eternity, Paul is explaining or he is, he is describing the suffering in this world as a very light affliction because when you have suffering in this world in light of affliction, it makes it uh, less when you have that perspective. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, you think about that, that verse in James, you know, our life is but a vapor. You say here, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, so having eternal perspective can change how you view suffering, right? It can help you to cope with your own suffering. Um, it can minimize maybe the injustice in the world, both by the rich and to the poor, because you know, hey, this life is very short. So even if there is suffering in the grand scheme of eternity, it's a much uh, I guess, smaller affair, if that makes sense. You know, people might say, you know, life is unfair for disabled persons. But yes, you know, if this life is all there is, it might be unfair. But in view of eternity, to whom much is given, much shall be required. God will balance the scales in eternity. So eternity, the, having an eternal perspective can really change your outlook on life. It can change how you respond to things. It can change how you see things. It's very important that we have an eternal perspective. It's going to change how you spend your time and your resources too when you have an eternal perspective. Are you only using your time and resources for the now, for the temporary, or are you using your time and resources for the eternal? And something very profound in this verse says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. So this is not only saying that we should have a view on eternity. But think about what this verse is saying. This verse is saying that everything that you can see with your eyes is temporary. <laughs> right? That's why we have to walk by faith, not by sight. Because if we live for the things that we can see, everything we can see is temporary. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? You think like everything that is visible is temporary. <laughs> because even your flesh, this, this is temporary, right? One day it's going to be changed. Right? The chairs, the building, the cars, the house, this world, this whole world is temporary. Everything that you can see is temporary. 
What do we live for? Right? That's why we need to be reminded. We live, we walk by faith, not by sight. Sight is the things we can see. How do we walk by faith? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we, we walk by what we hear from God's word. That's how we ought to live, not by the things that we see. Matthew 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's not only important that, you're, that you, you have an eternal perspective in terms of your spiritual eyes, but that's going to affect your heart as well. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the things you value in, your, in the world, whether you value things of eternity or whether you value things in this world, it's going to change where your heart is too. This is why it's good when people, and, we, and I sort of mentioned this last week, but I want to show you the verse this week. When people attend a funeral, right? And this is what Ecclesiastes 7 is talking about here. When people attend a funeral, they know that the end of all men one day is we will all die, right? One day this life will be over. It's temporary. It's but for a moment, like he says in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.18, right? It's but for a moment. And, you know, this is why the Bible is saying here, or Solomon is writing here in Ecclesiastes 7, that's good for us to remember that, that life is fleeting, that life will one day be over because then the living reflect on that. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 7. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. See, so he's, why is he saying the day of death is better than the day of one's birth? It's better to go to the house of mourning, like a funeral, than to go to the house of feasting, a celebration, a birthday, or any sort of celebration, than to, the house, than to go to the house of feasting. Why? For that. What is that? The house of mourning. That is the end of all men. And the living, those that are still alive, will lay it to his heart. Right? You'll reflect on, oh, you know, my life will be over soon. How am I building on my life? Am I being a wise builder? Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. See, isn't that interesting? The Bible says things like this, and yet people say, well, why does God allow suffering? Well, the God that allows suffering knows this. He's the one that said this. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. See, these are things that the world recognizes, but they still ask questions like, why does God allow suffering? But yet they know in business, oh, you've got to fail to, to do well. You've got to go through the nose to succeed. You've got to fall before you can rise. You know, and it's all, and people are like, so encouraged by it. But then at the same time, they reject God. That same world that says all that, they reject God and say, well, why does God allow all this suffering? Well, because he knows how to build people spiritually, not just physically in the physical world. Heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Do you see that? You see, like a wise person reflects on life and that life is fleeting and life can be over. Life, life is short, right? That's a wise person. The fool, though, his heart is in holidays. His heart is in, oh, what the pleasures I can get in this life. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth. What's mirth? Happiness, celebration, that sort of thing. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 3 where we started. This is the analogy that is given in terms of how we live our life. It's how we're building this building for God. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. So Paul is saying, hey, he's a wise master builder. Why? Because he's helping people to lay the foundation of this building that they need to build. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereof. But let every man take heed how... He buildeth thereupon. He's saying, take note. How are you building on this foundation? So we're saved. We believe on Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. That's the start. That's the concrete slab that everyone's got, the rock that we build that house on. And he's saying here, everyone needs to take note. How are you building on this house? Let every man take heed. How he buildeth thereupon. Every man. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation is Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, these are the different materials you can use to build this building. 
gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, why are these materials important? Well, what do they represent? Well, we're going to read on later how every man's work is going to be tried by fire. Well, some of these materials can survive fire, can't they? The gold, the silver, the precious stones. But the wood, hay, and stubble won't. So this is representing things that are seen, that are temporary, things that are unseen, eternal. How you build upon this foundation. You want to build with gold, silver, and precious stones, not wood, hay, and stubble. Because one day, we're going to realize how much treasure we actually laid up in heaven, as opposed to how much treasure we laid up on earth. Because the stuff that we lay up on earth, the stuff that's seen, all that stuff's going to be burnt up, right, at this judgment day. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Manifest, like made known, right? For the day shall declare it. So when, the, when it's saying the day, it's like one day when we see God, right? God is like the glory of the sun. The day is going to reveal our work. How is it going to reveal? Because it's going to try our work, as it describes in 1 Corinthians 3. And what is it, whatever's left, that's what you've got to show for it. So when you ask, you know, when you think about that saying, what have you got to show for it? It's going to be like on this judgment day. When your work that is on that foundation of Jesus Christ is tried with fire, what are you going to have on there? Is it going to be gold, silver, and precious stones? Or are you just going to be left with a concrete slab? You know, there's nothing on there. It's just wood, hay, and so all gone. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to hang your head in shame on that day, right? You want God to be able to say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Right, so this passage is often used by Orthodox Catholics to teach purgatory. As you can see, it's not the person that's being purged of their sins, right? It is, it is the work that is being tried. Right? So the work is on this foundation, the gold, silver, and precious stone. It's the work that's being tried, it's not the person. Right? If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. See, so after it's tried by fire, what's left of the gold, silver, and precious stones that you put on there? That's how you're going to be rewarded in God's eyes, right, when we go to heaven. If any man's work shall be burned, look at this, he shall suffer loss. That's the wood, hay, and the stubble. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So that's a great reassurance that even if you have nothing, even if you, didn't, even if you wasted your life living for yourself in this world, as long as you believe on Jesus Christ, you have that foundation, you will be saved. You'll still go to heaven. You're a child of God. But you just will be rewarded with less. Right? So there's a difference between heaven and rewards, remember. Heaven is not a reward. Don't think I'm going to heaven, I'm saved, I'm rewarded by going to heaven. No, that's a gift. Right? You believe on Jesus Christ, the gift is paid for by God, by Jesus dying on the cross. Right? That's a gift. We just receive that gift. But when we work for God, Right? We work for God. We build on that foundation, that gift, Jesus Christ. We build now on that, how we live our life, how we use our time and our resources to serve God. Right? And there's not only one way, there's many ways to serve God. How we use those resources to serve God, whether we're building gold, silver, precious stones on that or not, then when it's tried, what's left is, is how God is going to decide how much to reward you. Right? But he's not going to reward you based on wood, hay, and stubble. So I want you to reflect on that this morning. I want you to think about, hey, you know, when you think about these things, eternity, how you're building on this foundation, it's going to change. It should. It ought to change the order of the priorities in your life. You know, God isn't trying to give you like your best life now, right? He's trying to give you a life where you're growing and molding and serving him so that you'll have a, a better eternity. But, you know, when life is good, what do people tend to focus on, right? When life is good, everything's going well, you know, that's when you tend to focus on the temporal things, the things that are seen. You, tend to, you start to forget God because things are going well for you, right? That's why sometimes God has to bring some suffering into people's lives, bring them back, bring them back to thinking about Him, you know, focusing on those priorities, right? So that's what I want to do today. I want to, I want to sort of refocus your attention to that as we think about the new year. And we go on. We want to be a wise builder, right? We don't want to be un we don't want to walk as fools. We want to walk as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Okay. So let's talk first about as we build this building as wise builders. 
Number one, we need to have a wise foundation. A wise foundation. So Matthew 7, we know, uh, you know, uh, children even sang this morning, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. If you guys don't, didn't grow up singing action songs, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. It's an it's action song that, that reminds children of this, this parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 7. But we'll start from verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So we can see here that people are trying to build, build on, build something, but without the foundation. <laughs> they have the foundation of Jesus Christ. They come to Jesus Christ trying to earn their way into heaven with all the stuff that they think they've built. But Jesus says, I never knew you. Right? So it's not that Jesus says, I used to know you. So he didn't profess unto them, I used to know you, but then you didn't live right. That's why I don't know you anymore. He's saying, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because these people were never saved. And they did not believe on Jesus Christ. And you can tell by the way they responded. When, Jesus, when they came to Jesus saying, Lord, Lord, they didn't say, Lord, Lord, I believed on you. They say, Lord, Lord, look at all the works that I've done. And this is why he never knew them. They weren't saved. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. So obviously Jesus has been teaching through Matthew 5, Matthew 6, you know, Matthew 7. This is the, ser this is the Sermon on the Mount that's referred to. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, and we're talking about being a wise builder, right? Which built his house upon a rock. So you see how the wise man built his house upon a rock? What does the rock represent? That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. You can see how it all ties together. We build our life on the Word of God. That's how you're a wise builder, building your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only is that foundation salvation, but as we build the house... That salvation is based on God's word. I just love how, it's just, it's just beautiful like how things all tie together, you know, in the Bible. How it's like we build things on God's word, God's word's in us, Jesus is in us, and, and it's just, uh, I just think it's, it's, it's very, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just interesting how God hangs it all together, and it's just like, you know, somebody obviously had to think this through um, in order to, to deliver this, this sort of uh, wisdom to us, you know, that's why it has to come from God. It says, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. So notice how it's not just, just hearing the sayings makes you a wise builder. Right? Just think about that passage in James. You know, you hear the word, you're a hearer of the word, but not a doer. Right? It's like here. You're a wise person, a wise builder, not just by hearing the word. It's when you hear these sayings of mine, Jesus, and do it them. And you're an unwise builder, you're a foolish builder, when you hear these sayings of mine and do it them not. So notice that in this, these particular examples, it's not that the foolish builder has not heard God's word. <laughs> like the foolish builder has heard the word, and he's not doing it. Shall be likened, because you could say that it's more foolish to know the right thing to do and not do it, than to not know what to do at all, right? Hear it these sayings of mine, and do it them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. The rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and notice this, and great was the fall of it. That's always the passage in this parable, the wise, the two builders, that, I, that always sticks out at me. That you have the wise man building on the rock, you have the foolish man building on sand, and we can talk a bit about what those mean as well. But notice that when the, the house on the sand falls, it says, great was the fall of it. You know, that's why sometimes when people, they get out of church, you know, they, they fall in the faith, they, they, they fall terribly, you know, worse than, you know, people that maybe didn't, didn't know about it. You know, so... You've got to be careful. You need to make sure that you're building your house upon the rock because you don't want to build it on sand because when you do build it on sand, it's uh, great was the fall of it. So obviously the rock 
in this, um, in this parable represents building it on God's word. Right? That's how we build. We're a wise builder. When we have the right foundation, we're building it on God's word. So what is the wrong foundation? What is the, why, is it, why is it the wrong foundation represented by sand? Because sand is unstable, right? It shifts, it moves. So you can think about what, when people build their life on the wrong foundation, what is it? Well, maybe it's the shifting sands of man's opinion. You know, what's popular, what's not popular? What's the current craze, what's not the current craze? What are, how is culture now? So if you think of culture, that's just popular opinion. When you just think of society, and sometimes people just do what everyone else is doing, right? Why, do you, why are you you're working so hard and trying to put another story on your house? Why do you spend so much time in the garden? Or oh, they're keeping up with the Joneses. You know, they're keeping up with the Joneses. Are we building our life just based on the opinions of others, just culture, society, you know, the shifting sands of man's opinion, majority opinion, just what the majority think, or tradition and culture? These are things that shift and change. That's why, you know, my, my, my mother is quite superstitious and she looks into all this, she, she follows all this feng shui stuff, right? And feng shui, I just think, is, is a perfect example of the shifting opinions of man because it's just every feng shui book just says something different. You know, one person will say a mirror here is lucky, but another person will say a mirror here is unlucky. You know? And then it's like, you know, you have all these different people that believe different feng shui things. It's all in conflict, you know? What's lucky? What's not lucky? What number's not good? What number's not good? It's just the shifting opinion of, shifting sands of man's opinion, right? So Christians may not, you would hope not, be superstitious. You know, have little trinkets, things around the house, and all oh, this brings me good luck, and all that sort of stuff. You know, pictures of saints, pictures of other people. You know, you know, even a picture of an ancestor on the wall. Are oh, they looking over me? All this stuff is like superstitious. Christians ought not be. Our, our trust should be in God. Our trust should be in, in, in the Holy Spirit keeping us safe. Not all these trinkets, you know, and bringing us luck and all this stuff. This is, the, this is the shifting sands of the world and false religion. But what other ways do Christians do it? Build on the wrong foundation. What about building on just your own desires and feelings and emotions? What you feel is right to do. You, know, you, you get caught up in the world's philosophy of just follow your heart. Just follow your heart and do what you believe, what you feel is right. You know? Is that how we should be living our life? Is that, is that how we're building on the rock? You know, with our fickle emotions and our fickle feelings? No, that's, not, that's building on sand. Right? So how do you build on rock? You build on rock when you read the word. So how, do you, how do you know you're building it on Jesus? Jesus is the Word of God. So you read the Word of God. You're making decisions in light of what you know in God's Word. Right? That's how you're building on the rock. So decisions that you make, how you spend your time, you, you, you see them through the lens of the Bible first. You see them through the lens of Christianity and go, hey, this is what I should be doing. This is what's right to do because I have the perspective of God's Word, eternal perspective, all the things that we're talking about this morning. That's how you have a wise foundation. So it's not just this nebulous idea. When we say, hey, we're trying to live a you know, life of faith on God's word, we're trying to build our life on the rock, this is not just some nebulous thing that we don't know how to actually do. What that actually means is read the Bible, learn the Bible, know the Bible, so that when you make a decision in life, you're doing it with the knowledge of the Bible. That's how you know. And then when you do something, you're doing what God is telling you. The things that God says, the principles in God's word. That's how you do it. That's what it means. All right, so we've got a wise foundation. It's God's word. Jesus Christ. Number two is we want wise materials. Right? Wise materials. So what are we going to build on this foundation how do we do it? What's the, what's the wise materials? What are the foolish materials? Right? A wise builder is going to build with the wise materials. But let's first look at the unwise materials. Luke 12, verse 13. One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So isn't this the typical example, right? Like it's, 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 so, it's so sad when you see um, you know, a family member pass away 
you know, a parent, mother or father, and the, the last one passed away, and now the siblings are bickering over the inheritance, right? And so many, I'm sure all of you know somebody, or you maybe you've experienced it, you know, hopefully you're not this guy, right? Hopefully you're the one that's like, you know, you have a, an entire will that's entitled to you, and then somebody's, you know, maybe trying to take it from you. Hopefully you're not this person, right? Speak to my brother. They go to Jesus and go, hey, make sure I want to get my part of the inheritance. Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Right? Materialism, being materialistic. Covetousness. For man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Right? So that's, that's, a, that's what he's saying to this person. Don't be, you know, beware of covetousness. Right? Because what is he saying? This life, when he says, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses, he's saying, your life is not about how much wealth you have. Right? Your life is not about how much you, ha you have. Now, is it, does that mean it's wrong to have things? No, that's not saying it's wrong to have things. It's saying the purpose of your life is not this. Right? So every time we, we, we talk about money, it's like money is a means to an end. It's the problem is when it becomes an end. You know, when it becomes an end to people, that's what Jesus is saying, beware of here. Right? That that's, people want just an abundance of things. And he's saying here, this is not what your life is about. And now he's going to explain a parable to reinforce this, to say, this is not what your life's about. He spoke a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. So he's, his business is doing really well. And he thinks to himself, well, what am I going to do? Because I don't have enough room to store all this. And he says, this will I do, verse 18. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now what's interesting about this parable, and every time I think about this parable, I mean, this is basically describing retirement, isn't it? This is basically saying, look, you, you work hard, you build up all your riches, and then people say, to a point where I'm just going to take it easy and just live it up. Now, is this how God wants us to live? See, this is, not how, this is not how Christians should think of retirement, right? Christians should not go into retirement and say, oh, you know, I've worked my 45 years and now I can just like take it easy, not have any responsibilities, not set any example in the church. You know, all the, all the young people, I've done my hard yards, now all the young people can do it. You know, that sort of attitude, this is not the attitude that we should have as Christians as we get older, right? As we get older, we should still be working. Yes, our energy may be less. You know, we may not be able to do physically the same things as we do before, but that doesn't mean we serve God any less. Right? We serve God in different ways as we get older. But this is the sort of thing that we should not be striving for. Right? This, is, this is not the sort of life that we're trying to live as Christians, where we just work hard and then we just like live in pleasure and hedonism and just, you know, for, for, for our remaining days, right? Our brain rots away, you know, uh, on a holiday somewhere. This is basically describing what the world does. Verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool. See, we don't want to be the foolish builder. This was the foolish builder, right? With the foolish materials of just building up treasure on, on earth and then just wanting to enjoy it all, right? Rather than using his materials to lay up treasure in heaven, right? And this is the interesting thing about it. You know, we can convert those foolish materials almost into wise materials, right? Depending how we use them. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? See, there's a, there's a lot of that saying like in, the, in Ecclesiastes and in Proverbs where it's like, you know, you build up all this treasure and, you know, with, with more treasures, more problems. And then once you're gone, who are you going to give it? You don't know who you, the person you leave it to is going to be a wise man or a fool. And, and we see that in the world where riches built up is left to the next generation and the next generation just squanders it all. So you think like, you know, I'm, I'm building up this legacy, I'm building up all this, but you don't know whether the generations after you are just going to squander it all. Right? It's better to use your, your, your wealth 
to serve God with, right? And, 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 and use it to, you know, get the gospel out to more people or get, get you know, help in areas of, of ministry. So is he. It says, but God said unto him, verse 20, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul shall be required of thee. And who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he. So this is now Jesus making you reflect on yourself, saying, you don't want to be this rich fool. Right? Don't be this person. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Right? So what does the gold, so we know that's like the wood, hay, and the stubble. It's all the things that are seen. What does the gold, silver, and precious stones represent? Well, this is one thing we ask Everyone, when, you know, when we're at the door sometimes, somebody gets saved, we try to encourage them to get in church, go soul winning. You know, and you ask them, hey, what's, what's the only thing you can take to heaven with you? Well, the only thing you can take to heaven, well, one is yourself. The other is other people. Right? When you preach the gospel, you explain to people how to be saved, they get saved, this is how you bring your sheaves with you. Right, so what are these precious stones, these gold, silver, and precious stones being built on this foundation? They are people. Right? They are people that we are trying to convince to believe on Jesus Christ. When they believe on Jesus Christ, they become part of this building of God, right? this, this structure that we are helping God to build, building God's house. That's why that, there's that picture in the Old Testament, all the people coming and building God's house. That's the picture of of soul winning, right? That's the picture of the church's job, to go and build God's house on the foundation, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, but we build, you know, this house of God, which is all the believers that we are adding to the kingdom. First Peter 2, 4, To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Right, that's talking about Jesus. Here in verse 5, ye also, look at this, as lively stones, right? these precious stones, are built upon a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, so that's Jesus, he's the chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallow, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto also they were... Uh, oh, I must have not copied the rest of that verse there. <clears throat> so, we are those lively stones. We are built up a spiritual house. That's what we are building on this foundation. Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? So he's talking about these rewards. He's getting later. He says here, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Right? So these wise materials are people. Right? These, are, these are people that we are building on this foundation. Right, so we've got the wise foundations, Jesus Christ, and the wise materials, these are people. These are not things that are seen. These are the souls of people, these precious stones being built up on this house. Now, if you know what the wise materials are, you know what the wise foundation is, hopefully that's going to change your purpose in life. So a wise builder is going to have a wise purpose. Right? So if you know the judgment day, what's going to be left, and you know, hey, that's what you should be building towards, right? Getting people on this foundation, right? Look at what it says here in 2 Peter 3. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, this is the verse, this is the verse that I always ask Calvinists about, right? So this is what I'm always thinking about. This verse and others, where it's like, See, the thing that nev never makes sense to me about Calvinism, and which I think is the hardest thing for them to answer, is if God is the one that chooses who goes to heaven or who goes to hell. Well, that's what Calvinism teaches, right? It's called predestination. It's like he, he decides. He's basically deciding who can believe to believe on him. It's not, it's not us. It's not our free will choice. But the question is, is if, if God is the one that decides, 
who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, but he tells us that his will is that nobody should perish, but that all should come to repentance, why would he not then save everyone? That doesn't make sense. It's like a, it's like a con contradiction in his will. So he wills one thing, that all should be saved, but yet when he made the choice, he didn't save everyone. So it, just, it doesn't make sense. And I think that's, that's one of the, the tougher objections to Calvinism. So he's not slack, he's not slack concerning his promise. He's long-suffering to us, word. He wants everyone to be saved, right? That all should come to repentance. So repentance doesn't mean he's, he's willing in here. It's not saying he's willing that everyone turn from their sins. That is something he's willing as well. But when he's talking about salvation, it's that all should repent, meaning turn to believe on Jesus. Right? Repentance is a change of mind. You stop, you're not, if somebody's not believing in Jesus, they repent, now they believe on Jesus. Right? It's not that you were sinning, now you're not sinning and you're believing on Jesus. Right? These, are, these are two different things. That all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So notice how we talked about the things that are seen are temporal. Why are they all temporary? Because one day, at the judgment, they will all be gone. Right? You see how the earth, heaven and earth, Jesus says, shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Heaven shall pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's why anything that's seen, you work towards all this, this physical stuff, one day it's all going to be gone. Shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, all these physical things, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So what am I talking about here? Having a wise purpose. Saying if, if you lose of all the stuff that's seen is all one day going to be gone, that should change your purpose, right? That should change the reason why you're living, what you're living for. So we're going to be a wise builder, wise foundation, wise materials. If we're wise, our purpose should change as well. Why do we do the things we do? Having a wise purpose. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There's that eternal perspective. right? We're looking to eternity. We're looking to the things of heaven. We're laying up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Right? So we don't have a wise purpose. What's our wise purpose? Our purpose should be the Great Commission. Right? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, teaching people the word of God. Now, does that mean it's wrong to have other work? No, because it's about the purpose. The purpose is the why you do things. You know, why are you doing the things you do? Right? You say, I, work, I need to work, I need to make money. Yeah, but why do you need to work and to make money? So you have the resources to live, to provide for your family. Why? So that they can learn God's word and learn how to preach the gospel, get other people saved, build precious stones on that foundation. Right? That's how you have that purpose. It's that, it's that higher calling. Right? So the higher calling is not just, I want to live a good life. The higher calling is not just, I want to provide for my children. The higher calling is, I'm doing it to serve God, right? To build precious stones on that. So, can you do these other things? Yes, but why are you doing them? For the higher calling of God in Christ Jesus. Right? Is it wrong to have fun? Is it wrong to have fun, relax, recovery, a bit of R&R? &R? No. But why enjoy some things? Right? So you can get some rest, relaxation, recover, so you can be more productive to then serve God and then build more on this foundation with these gold, silver and precious stones. Now, why get married? So you just get married because you don't want to be alone. It's not high enough. Purpose not high enough. Right? Get married. Yes, have some company. Raise some children. To serve God. Right? Build on this precious, these precious stones on this foundation. You know, it's like why we have a church, a godly community. Get people planted in here. 
Is it just for social reasons? No. Right? Is it just to serve you? No. The higher calling is, if I want to learn, so we're more effective witnesses, so we can go out, preach the gospel, answer objections, be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Why? So we can build more precious stones on this foundation. You know, some of us in here, we're quite passionate about resisting tyrannical governments. But is, is freedom in and of itself an end in and of itself? No. Well, it's like, why do we want freedom? Why do we want the government to leave us alone so we can live a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty? So we can preach the Bible, so we can teach believers the Word of God, so believers who know the Word of God, spirit-filled, can go out, preach the gospel to others, get them saved, build on this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones. So you see, so you don't want just these means to an end, to become your end. Your end is, you want a wise purpose, right? To, uh, to, to build on this foundation. So you want to ask yourself, in conclusion, right? Do you, do you have a wise purpose? Or are you like the rich fool, right? Just seeking ease, seeking pleasure, seeking to serve yourself, right? Last verse, just closing thought. Hebrews 9, 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So we have one death. You know, if, you, if you're born once, die twice. You know, you've got to be born twice, and you die, you'll die once, right, physically. But what I like you to reflect on, and what I always think about when I think about this verse, is like, you have one death, you know what that means? You have one life to live. Now, how are you going to use that life? Because one day, you know, this life is going to be over. And then, you're going to, and then there's going to be the judgment. And do you have a wise foundation? Do you have wise materials? Do you have a wise purpose? Are you a wise builder? Right? How are you building upon your foundation? All right, I hope you reflect on that this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for giving us instruction and example to how to be a wise builder. Help us to not walk as fools. Help us to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Pray, Lord, that each one here, uh, each one that's hearing your word this morning, I pray, Lord, that your spirit will move in their heart. It will provoke them unto love and to good works. I pray, Lord, that this year will be the best year spiritually for each and every one in this room. So, Lord, use us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.